Hey everybody, today we're debating who is Muhammad and we're starting right now with Muji's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, Muji. The floor is all yours. All right, thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, I, I became uh, atheist at uh, 25 because I couldn't see any evidences for existence of God. Not because there were no evidences, but because I couldn't see them. <clears throat> Many years later, when I got more knowledge, I realized that I was wrong. I didn't convert to Islam because Allah is God or Muhammad was his messenger, but because God sent us many prophets to solve our problems. He created us like all other creatures as animals, but the smartest animals in order to communicate with us and to guide us to, uh, out of the jungle we are living in. We are living in a jungle, but a modern one. Animals is not a form, but a way of life, which the most important behavior of animals uh, life is selfishness. Me, just me. I don't care about anyone else. And I am ready to kill millions of people because uh, I want to become richer and richer. This smart animal uses all means to become richer. Some produce and sell tobacco and kill 5 million people every year in the world for making billions of dollars. Some produce drugs and alcohol and killing millions of people for the same purpose. Some produce weapons and for selling uh, their weapons, they create conflicts and wars in order to become richer. Some spread hate against other races and religions like Adolf Hitler did. Some abuse religions to become richer like many priests, monks, rabbis, and monks. Some like David Wood and his friend AP spread hate against Muslims and Islam by demonizing Islam and Muslims by a bunch of trash fabricated hadiths in order to get more followers and make money. God sent us prophets to guide us out of the jungle we are living in. All these problems humanity is facing is because of the jungle and the rules of the jungle. The rules are simple. Strongest get the most and the weakest one get the least or nothing. The purpose of creation wasn't that we always stay animals and live in the jungle, but the purpose was that we get out of the jungle and become humans and live in a human world where no bad deeds happens. Everyone loves one another and share everything with each other. No killings, no drugs, no bad deeds at all. That utopia is possible to become reality by the guidance of Almighty God. Human is either a form, but a way of life. The more you sacrifice for your own kind, the more human you are. God sent us prophets not to solve just problems, but all of them, uh, not to solve just few problems, but all of them entirely. Did he solve any problems? Those who deny it uh, should read the history. Just a few examples are what Romans and Greeks used to do in those stadiums where they forced the slaves to butcher each other and they were cheering and loving it. Or they used to stone or uh, crucify people. All those barbaric acts disappear by the beautiful message of Jesus, peace be found. Persian empire never used such barbaric acts despite it was the biggest empire in 2,500 years ago. Why? Because Persians followed a, message of, uh, a messenger of God who taught them only three main teachings, good deeds, good words, and good speech. Only with these three teachings, we had Cyrus the Great, who was a liberator and had the first human rights laws in the history. And he still loved by the Jews because he freed them and let them go back to their land. Now, did God solve all our problems? No. Did he want to solve all our problems? Yes. So for that, he uh, gave his final message to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But why we still uh, have so many problems? Because our problems are too complicated and the solution is also complicated. So it was too early for the people of the past to understand it. But now in 21st century, the time has come for uh, people to understand it and accept it. This is what I'm trying to do. And if we get enough time, we may talk about the solution. 
Today, I want to uh, teach David Wood a great message of Jesus, peace be upon you, which was love one another and love your neighbors as yourself. This is not quantum physics that David Wood doesn't understand. Uh, what does that mean? I can knock on my Christian neighbor's doors and chew their Bible and say, I love you, but I hate your Bible and I hate your religion. I love you, but I believe your God was stupid. I can't say I love Christian, but I demonize them and say they, are, they all believe in the same Christianity that KKK believe in. At least your friend, apostate prophet, doesn't claim that he follows the messenger of love, peace, but you do. So please learn your own religion and follow it correctly before criticizing others. If only a single person listened to your lies and attack uh, a Muslim because he or she thinks that Muslims are demons, uh, and you are also guilty of that crime. Who wants to become my friend if they believe in your lies about Islam? You find every rubbish fabricated hadiths or any terrible incident happens in Islamic world to demonize entire Islam and Muslims. I never say anything against Christians or other religions despite followers of other religions do a lot of crimes against humanity because I know there are so many loving people among Christians. <clears throat> Who wants to be my friend if they believe that Islam is what you, AP, ISIS, and Taliban describe and present? Do I, do I have to explain uh, for everyone that I don't believe in that stupid religion you, AP, ISIS, and Taliban claim to be Islam? <clears throat> I converted to Islam for the solution to all our problems. Now, if David Wood proves me that Christianity has the solution to a single major problems we have today, like drug problem, then I convert to Christianity right now because if one major problem is solved totally, then all uh, will be solved as the source of all problems is one. <clears throat> this is my statement and uh, we will talk more. I, I don't have more to say now. Thank you very much for that. Opening statement, Muji. We are going to jump into the next opening statement from David Wood, which will also be 12 minutes. And I want to say thanks so much, folks, for being with us. Whether you be Muslim, atheist, Christian, you name it, we are glad you are here as we are a neutral channel hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. Thanks so much, David. The floor is all yours. Thank you, James. And <clears throat> thank you, Muji, for challenging me to debate and for presenting your perspective on Muhammad. So, who was Muhammad? Uh, I've been thinking about that question for a long time. My Muslim friends tell me that he was a prophet, and that's Muji's perspective as well. Um, but lots of people down through history have claimed to be prophets. There are people in the world today who claim to be prophets. They contradict each other on all kinds of revelations, so they can't all be right. And so what we have to do is test them, examine them, and see whether they're real prophets. And when we examine these prophets, we have to consider three main possibilities. Uh, one, the person who claims to be a prophet could be getting revelations from his own mind. Uh, so these revelations could have a purely human origin. Whether the person is deliberately deceiving people, whether he knows he's just making up revelations, or whether he's you know, deluded or insane and actually thinks he, that he's getting revelations, uh, we have to consider the possibility that a person is getting revelations from his, own, from his own mind. Second, we have to consider the possibility that something darker may be at work. So a person could be getting revelations, but actually be getting them from something other than God. So Christians, Muslims, and others believe in demonic forces, and so we have to consider the possibility that someone is getting revelations from demons. And the third possibility would be that someone is actually getting revelations from God, in which case we should believe those revelations. Um, so it's important to examine someone like Muhammad uh, in light of these three possibilities. Did his revelations come from his own mind? Did they come from demons? Did they come from God? Let's think about the evidence. 
When we ask ourselves what evidence there is that Muhammad was getting his revelations from his own mind, so his revelations had a human origin, we find that Islam really seems like a religion that came from the mind of a 7th century Arabian caravan robber, uh, because Islam is basically a collection of teachings and practices that were present in Arabia during Muhammad's time. Jewish monotheism had spread into many communities in Arabia, along with biblical and non-biblical stories about various prophets, uh, teachings about Jesus and Mary that were popular in certain groups were being taught in Arabia, uh, things like Jesus speaking at birth, Jesus giving life to clay birds, Mary giving birth under a palm tree, and so on. Uh, the Sabians, who are mentioned in the Quran, prayed at all five of the times that Muslims pray during their daily prayers, and they recited a creed, La ilaha illallah. Muslims recite this creed today. Many of the polytheists of Arabia performed ablutions, these ceremonial washings. They took an annual pilgrimage to Mecca. They circled the Kaaba. They kissed the black stone that supposedly fell from heaven. All of these teachings and practices became a part of Islam, which means that Islam is exactly the sort of religion we would expect to arise in 7th century, century Mecca. So we have good reasons to think that Islam had a human origin, the mind of a man who was deeply affected by the teachings and practices that surrounded him, a man who felt comfortable plagiarizing everyone else's sources. Here we could add that many of Muhammad's so-called revelations had no purpose other than satisfying his perverted desires. He received a revelation telling him to marry a prepubescent girl. He received a revelation telling him to marry the divorced wife of his own adopted son after he caused the divorce by lusting after her. He received a revelation telling him that he could violate the four wife limit. He received a revelation telling him to break an oath he made to his wives after he swore that he would stop having sex with his slave girl. All of this looks very, very man-made. But we should also look to see if there might be something darker at work. Uh, here we find plenty of evidence suggesting that forces beyond Muhammad were involved in his teachings. We know from Muslim records that when Muhammad began receiving revelations, his first impression was that he was demon-possessed. And if you read about Muhammad's experience with whatever it was that roughed him up in that cave, you'll see that first impressions are often correct. We also know that after his experience in the cave, he became suicidal and tried to hurl himself off a cliff. According to the earliest Muslim sources, Muhammad was tricked into delivering a revelation from the devil. These are the so-called satanic verses where Allah gave Muslims permission to pray to three pagan goddesses. Muhammad revealed these verses as part of the Quran, but he later came back and said, sorry, the devil made me do it. We also know from Muslim sources that Muhammad claimed that he was a victim of black magic, a spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. On top of all this, if you read accounts of what happened to Muhammad when he was receiving revelations, it's like you're reading a screenplay from an exorcist film. So Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that he was demon possessed. His revelations made him suicidal. Even Muslim sources claim that he delivered a revelation from the devil and that he was a victim of black magic. And the way he received revelations was thoroughly demonic. It seems that we don't just have evidence that Muhammad's revelations had a human origin. We also have good evidence of spiritual problems. The question now is whether there's any evidence that Muhammad's revelations came from God. What evidence do we have that Muhammad's revelations came from God? What evidence has Muji given? It sounds like he just said, well, I believe that God has sent prophets to solve our problems, uh, even to establish a utopia, and he believes that Muhammad was the final one. What evidence did he give us? Unless I missed it, I didn't see any other than him saying it. So I saw absolutely no evidence in that opening statement that Muhammad was a final prophet sent to solve the world's problems. Um, haven't seen any evidence for that claim other than Muji saying it. So I guess all we would have to go on there is Muji's belief that Muhammad was sent to solve the world's problems. And if Muji, if that's what you believe, I have to say, Muhammad did a pretty terrible job of it, like the worst job of solving the world's problems ever. Uh, 
if I want, if I were to be as generous as possible, um, I would, and, and I have in the past. Granted that uh, Muhammad did do something to stop female infanticide. Um, and so I think that it's commendable that he stopped female infanticide. So if anyone doesn't know what that is, uh, there was the same thing in the Roman Empire that Christians uh, eventually outlawed. Uh, and that's where if you had a bunch of children and you didn't want daughters, you'd just you just throw your daughters somewhere, throw them into a river, throw them out in the desert, something like that to get rid of them. Um, and if the Muslim sources are correct, then Muhammad condemned that practice and put an end to it in Arabia. So we could commend him for that. Apart from that, what what problems has Muhammad stopped and what problems would his revelation stop if they were taken seriously? Um, and it, I mean, the Quran says that Jews and Christians are the worst of creatures. That's Surah 98 verse 6. The Quran says that uh, Muslims are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. So wherever Islam goes, you end up with this uh, uh, this. this the, the upper class and then the second class citizens. So that's not that's not solving the world's problems. What else do we have? We have polygamy. We have the problem of wife beating, Surah 4, verse 34 of the Quran. We have uh, jihad against unbelievers. So fight those who do not believe in Allah. That's a command has led to uh, all kinds of violence in the world. Um, we've got what? We've got child marriage. That's in the Quran and the Hadith. We've got female genital mutilation. Uh, we have these ongoing problems, and you can look at statistics about the worst places in the world to be a woman, and whoever do, whoever puts the data together ends up claiming that 11 of the top 12 worst places in the world to be a woman are Muslim-majority countries, or they'll say that you know 16 of 18 or 18 of 20. Uh, Islam just does a terrible job at making places uh, that are good for women. Uh, beyond that, if Islam is here to solve the world's problems, my goodness, I mean, Muslims have dozens of countries where they can live under Islamic law and where they have the majority which of those countries are places where people would actually want to live? Who says, hey, I want to go to this Muslim country because of the great you know, scientific education you get there? You don't. It's Muslims fleeing Muslim countries to get to Western nations where you have tons of Christians and atheists. So again, if Muhammad was here to solve the world's problems, did a terrible, terrible, terrible job. Um, Apart from the, and there's really nothing else that uh, Muji said that I would have to respond to as part of the argument. So I can just go off topic a little with what he said. Uh, he advised me to love my neighbors, said I can't chew on someone's book. Uh, I could just point out, I have about two minutes left. Um, I don't regard that as unloving. If you look at that situation, if you look at that situation, you had Muhammad Hijab threatening the apostate prophet's wife with rape and torture and advising his followers, and he has hundreds of thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of followers, advising them to go out and do the same, to harass, harass the wives of critics of Islam with threats of rape and torture, heaping abuse and insults on them. And what did I do? I did exactly what the Quran says. The Quran says that if I want to stop people with the insults, I what? I say, hey, I'm going to insult your religion. So I told Muhammad Hijab, if you're going down this road of threatening people's wives, um, then I'll eat your book. That's exactly what the Quran says. That's the purpose of Surah 6, verse 108 of the Quran. The historical background was Muslims had been insulting uh, the, the gods and goddesses of the pagans and the pagans finally said, look, stop insulting us. If you don't stop insulting us, we're going to stop. We're going to insult Allah. And that's when Muhammad received the revelation. Stop insulting their gods if they're going to insult you. So if Allah didn't want me doing that, uh, he shouldn't have revealed that. So I'll just say I don't regard it as unloving to stop someone from horrible behavior. I don't regard it as unloving to make someone stop mm -hmm. abusing and harassing women. So I think that is loving. And all I can say now is uh, we have no evidence at all that Muhammad is a true prophet. All we have is evidence that he received revelations from his own mind and that some may have been 
demonic. With that, we're going to jump into the rebuttal sections. So these are seven minutes apiece, starting with you, Muji. Thanks so much. The floor is all yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I would like to say, uh, uh, of course, the, um, David uh, mentioned a lot of uh, different things. And for example, he uh, said that Muslims uh, run from their country uh, to come to the West. Unfortunately, uh, that uh, goes to, to uh, <clears throat> To politic, which I'm sure that uh, David has not so good knowledge of that, because I am 42 years involved in politics, and I know what West has done to not only Muslim countries but uh, every countries, even in Latin America. They run away, come to to USA. They don't run away because of Christianity. They run away from those who made coup d'état in their countries, abused their countries. Many Christian countries in Africa. Uh, Christian countries in uh, Asia, like Philippines, okay? So in uh, Muslim countries, uh, like my home country, uh, Iran, would be the best country on the planet uh, and richest country on the planet if your country, uh, your politicians, Mr. David Wood, USA and UK didn't uh, made a coup d'etat against our beloved democratic uh, prime minister, Dr. Mossadegh in 1953 and put a dictator in power. And when we made it blind, a uh, revolution in 1979 against that dictator that was puppet of the West, uh, uh, Ayatollah BBC, we call it, Radio BBC Persia, guided us to a backward extremist uh, caveman called Ayatollah Khomeini. He will, they were uh, the propaganda machine for this uh, caveman ISIS guy, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, because they were believing that if uh, the leftist group take the power in Iran, uh, Iran would uh, join Soviet Union. That's why they they um, act, uh, they took uh, this uh, barbaric man uh, instead of those uh, you know modern democratic uh, uh, other alternatives. So and uh, in all these forty two years, they have been supporting this dictator regime. Uh, only your president Obama paid them over hundred billion dollars in two thousand fifteen when Iranian regime was going to fall. So this is politic and you don't want to go there because we run away from the dictators and the bombs you, uh, you know, your dictators drop out on us. So we don't run away because, for example, my home country is could be the richest country on the planet. We have so much oil, so much gas. So uh, why we run away? Why have I have left my home country, which I love because uh, there is a dictator uh, government there and we want to bring it down. And uh, unfortunately, the West the only one i can say the only one who in all these years stood against the iranian fascist regime was donald trump he put the hardest sanction on the godfather of isis the central bank of international uh, uh, you know terrorism which is iranian regime but now joe biden is trying very hard to you know to help them from falling and they try but uh, uh, fortunately there is a lot of resistance in in the you know in the um, uh, uh, Congress against uh, Joe Biden to go back to that uh, deal with the fascist regime of Iran. So Iran uh, get all those money and send it to Syria, to Iraq, to Yemen, to Lebanon, armed Lebanon. Just uh, uh, Hezbollah has $700 million a year budget from Iran. So don't please say that uh, these problems happening in Muslim world is because of Islam. And Muhammad Hijab, I'm myself fighting this uh, extremist. 42 years I've been fighting the extremists. I've been banned by this, uh, blocked by these extremist uh, uh, YouTubes like EF Dawa, Sapien Institute, all of them. And uh, uh, you, you uh, yes, you, you said uh, other things like uh, beating wives and uh, so on. If we get time, I will uh, talk about those uh, issues as well, but uh, <clears throat> none of them have anything to do with Islam. Yes, uh, we can talk, uh, do that in, uh, uh, in the next section because I would like to ask direct questions from David. Thank you very much, Muji, for that rebuttal. We'll kick it over to David for his rebuttal. I want to remind you, folks, our guests are linked in the description. You can click on those links to learn more about our guests. Thanks so much, David. The floor is all yours. All right, well, uh, in my opening statement, I pointed out that 
Uh, when we're examining someone who claims to be a prophet, there are three possibilities that we should consider. Uh, first, the person might be getting revelations from his own mind. Uh, he might be deliberately inventing revelations or he might be insane. Uh, but it's clear that some so-called revelations have a purely human origin. Uh, second, the person might be getting revelations from demonic sources, actually receiving revelations. Uh, but these revelations just don't come from God, come from somewhere else. And third, someone who claims to be a prophet may genuinely be receiving revelations from God, in which case we should believe him. So I showed that we have good reasons to think that Muhammad was getting his revelations from his own mind. If you take the teachings and practices that were circul circulating, in, uh, circulating in Arabia during the time of Muhammad, and you roll them all up into a ball, you get something that looks a lot like Islam. And Muhammad kept receiving revelations that had no purpose other than satisfying his perverted desires. How did Muji respond? He said, maybe we'll talk about some of this in, uh, in our discussion. So I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, next, I showed that we also have good reasons to think that something demonic was at work in the life and teachings of Muhammad. Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that he was demon possessed. His revelations made him suicidal. Uh, even Muslim sources claim that he delivered a revelation from the devil and that he was a victim of black magic. And the way he received revelations was thoroughly demonic. How did Muji respond? He didn't. So notice, so far, we have no reason to doubt that Muhammad was receiving revelations from his own mind and that there was something demonic at work in at least some of his revelations. So my entire case is standing and we're almost at the end of the rebuttal period. Uh, finally, I said that we have no reason whatsoever to think that Muhammad was actually a prophet. Uh, Muji uh, argued uh, in his opening that uh, Muhammad, well, he, he just claimed that Muhammad was sent to solve the world's problems. I pointed out that if Muhammad was actually sent to solve the world's problems, if that's what his purpose was, uh, especially to establish some utopia where all our problems are solved, uh, I said that Muhammad did a really, really bad job of this. Muhammad did a really, really bad job. Um, and then I pointed out that as evidence that Muhammad has done a bad job, if that's why he sent, if that's why he was sent, that uh, people are fleeing the Muslim world as rapidly as they can. And this is where Muji actually offered a response. He said, Muslims fleeing Muslim countries, uh, that has to do with politics. And he complains about Western nations interfering in Muslim countries. Um, I'll say two things here. One, no objection from me that Western nations uh, screw up <laughs> other parts of the world. They'll see uh, some regime that they don't like and they'll say, oh, we'll help this other regime topple that regime. And they don't realize that maybe very frequently the other regime that they're going to support in toppling the regime they don't like could turn out to be much worse and it just wasn't in power and then they helped it get to power. So no disputing that. My point is, my point entire, my point still stands, right? If, uh, if Muhammad was sent to solve the world's problems and here we are 14 centuries later, Islam hasn't solved any of the world's problems and it can't stand up against Western nations. I mean, there, again, there are dozens of Muslim majority countries. Some of them are sitting on seas of oil under the ground. Um, why can't they solve the world's problems using these wonderful teachings of Muhammad that were given to solve the world's problems? Um, I can only conclude, and by the way, this is indisputable, if Muhammad was sent, if that's the reason that Muhammad was sent to solve all of the world's problems and to establish some sort of utopia, he's just done the most horrible job of anyone in history. Um, and I'll just, I'll just go ahead and give you my perspective on this. Um, Islam is not, has never been, and never will be, a solution to any problems, even though you could point to something like I think Muji said something about tobacco. If you wanted to say I'm, I have no idea what Islam is going to do about tobacco or something like that. Uh, but let's suppose that in the Quran, you find some verse that says outlaw tobacco or ban tobacco or something like that. If you found something like that, Islam would still not be the solution to tobacco, if that's what you're concerned about, because it's, the solution would be worse than the problem you're trying to deal with. In other words, I, I, I don't smoke, but I would rather smoke all my life and die of lung cancer than 
convert to the teachings of Islam, because I believe that's how horrible they are. So when, when Muji is saying that Islam is a solution to any of the problems that we currently face, uh, and I'm thinking about the size of the problem that he's talking about and the number of problems that Islam would bring if we brought in Islam to solve the problem. It's like Muji is saying, it's like I come to Muji and I say, uh, man, I got a problem. Muji says, hey, what's your problem? And I say, oh man, I got a, I got a, I got a toothache. My, my tooth is really hurting back here. And he says, no problem, I've got the solution. I say, really, what's the solution? He says, well, I've got this dull steak knife here and I'm gonna slowly saw your head off. And once I saw your head off, then you won't have the toothache anymore. Well, that's true. That would and that would sort of solve the, the problem of my toothache in a weird way. Uh, but the solution would be worse than the problem that I was actually dealing with. And so uh, Islam is not has is not has never been never will be a solution to any of the world's problems. Uh, finally, uh, Muji says that he's been uh, he's been fighting extremists for years. Uh, that's certainly commendable. But if he's talking about extremists within Islam, then why do you have those extremists within Islam? It's because Allah and Muhammad commanded things like fight those who do not believe in Allah. Muhammad said, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah. Uh, we have commands to kill apostates. Uh, these are the commands that you have, and these are the commands that people who believe in Muhammad follow. So when you fight against the extremists, you're fighting against people who are taking your prophet's revelations very seriously, more seriously than you are. And so here we are at the end of the rebuttal period. And once again, based on all of the evidence we've seen so far, we have to conclude that Muhammad was a false prophet. Thank you very much, David, for that opening, or I should say for that rebuttal section. We're going to jump into the open discussion. And I want to remind you folks, our guests are linked in the description. Thanks so much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours for open discussion. What do you want to, what do you want to talk about, Muji? All right. Okay. Very good. Yeah, it's just said that um, I don't think that we can solve all problems uh, um, in this discussion, but uh, we can shortly uh, talk about many of them. Okay? okay, revelation. You said revelation from his mind, but uh, what I read uh, in Quran that was uh, even if it was from his mind. First of all, um, I was talking to an atheist, uh, uh, a professor atheist. I said, if these prophets that you claim uh, that were, uh, you know. God doesn't exist, then all these prophets, they were uh, a bunch of uh, uh, charlatans because they lied or they were, uh, you know, some, uh, they had some delusions. Um, and um, if they were uh, liars, uh, charlatans, then how come they put their lives in danger and they uh, brought us so many beautiful, uh, you know, revelations and commands. And if uh, Prophet Muhammad was one of them as well that you claim, uh, then he, uh, the Quran he um, brought us was uh, a beautiful book. And uh, uh, another thing is that, of course, um, when you um, uh, read Quran, uh, I'm sure that you uh, don't understand the true meaning of the uh, uh, Quran. I will come to that as well. But uh, uh, you were ask, uh, saying as well, sit, uh, you know, Muslim countries sitting on oil, why they cannot solve uh, the problems of the world uh, or, or something like that, you said. First of all, I, I told you as well that it's not only Muslim countries that in, are in such a problem. There are so many Christian countries also uh, uh, have such a problems like entire Latin America, okay, entire Africa. And they are, uh, they are not just um, Muslim countries in Africa. So the problem is deeper is because of, as I told you from beginning, is because of the jungle and its rules. So everybody wants to become richer. And many people abuse religion as well. Like my home country, Iran, the, the mullahs there, they are a bunch of mafia and uh, they just become billionaires by killing people. So uh, it's not because of Islam, it's because of the, the jungle that allowed them to become billionaires by killing people, okay? The rules of the jungle. So I would like to uh, say uh, the solution to problems, um, I will talk to you later about that. The solution mm -hmm. to problems is to get rid of this, the, the, the rules of the jungle, that you don't become richer by, by producing uh, you know, tobacco and kill five million people. I never said that the solution is uh, banning tobacco. The solution, I will talk to you about that as well. Let's see why uh, Christianity, uh, why God uh, solved some problems in the past, which I mentioned that Christianity solved many problems. 
thanks Jesus Christ and thanks Moses and all other prophets, okay? But why God didn't solve all our problems? Did he want to solve few problems or he wanted to solve all problems, David, in, in your opinion? Um, I, I, I don't believe that, that prophets uh, came to solve all problems and to establish uh, no, a no, no, no. utopia. My, my, uh, my, my question was that they solved some problems uh, the, why did God God wanted to solve those problems, or He didn't want to solve it? That it just happened. Um, I mean, if you look at what the prophets say, they say you're going to have problems all the way up until the judgment. So you're not you're not getting any sort of any sort of utopia. But let me just go back to the couple of things you said because I actually agree with you on on some things. So uh, you you brought you brought up you said that uh, in your discussion with an atheist friend, uh, you were saying, hey, if prophets were uh, charlatans, if they're just making things up, then why did they risk their lives? And I actually agree with that criterion. Uh, that's why I, I believe that Muhammad believed that he was a prophet, right? And, and I would use the same criterion. Uh, the general rule is called liars make poor martyrs. Uh, if someone's going out and risking his life, um, claiming that he's got a revelation from God, uh, chances are he believes it because if he didn't believe it, then as soon as his life was at risk, he would want to uh, change his story a little bit. Um, you said, I don't understand the true meaning of the Quran. Uh, if that's correct, then the Quran has a problem because, I mean, you've got 14 centuries worth of Muslim scholars who would say a lot of the exact same things about Islam that I say. So, you know, people like Ibn Abbas and Ibn Kathir and the two Jalals and all the way down to modern scholars like Maududi would say very similar things about us, about the Quran that I would say, and they would disagree with you. And so if they're actually uh, reading the Quran and reading the Arabic and they're coming to completely different conclusions from the from the conclusions you're coming to, and I'm agreeing with them then it seems like, I mean, if you're, if you're the only person who actually understands the true meaning of these passages and all of Islam's best scholars for 14 centuries have been getting this wrong, then it sounds like the Quran itself is so hopelessly unclear that it can't be the solution to the world's problems because it's just not clear. Uh, you said that the, the, the Iranian mullahs are, are bad. We're on the same page there. And, uh, then we got to the solution to problems. So, what were you what were you saying about um, about solutions to problems? And I said that the the, the source of the problems are um, you know the the rules of the jungle that allows yeah. people. Can, can, by the way, uh, but but can you give examples of what you're talking about? Because you're saying rules of the jungle, and I'm not sure exactly yeah, the, what you're talking yeah. about. So, give us some the examples. Rules, yeah, the rules of the jungle is that you are stronger, you get the mo uh, you get more. You are weaker, you get least uh, less. So uh, in, in this jungle, uh, you can kill millions of people and become billionaire. Like, as I said, the mullahs of Iran, for example, this current uh, leader in Iran, he didn't have a flat, you know, uh, before the revolution, he, he was renting flat. Now he's over hundred billion dollars rich, okay, by killing millions of people. So this jungle allows such a people, uh, or even uh, as I mentioned, those who produce tobacco and kill 5 million people a year, I have counted it's like 33 nuclear bombs, uh, Hiroshima nuclear bombs blowing up on, the, uh, on this planet and nobody care about that. So um, about Quran, um, yeah, I, I was uh, uh, saying that uh, the, the, the rules allows those people to kill all these people and become billionaires, okay? Uh, anyway, about the, the, the Quran that you said, I will uh, prove you that... Uh, uh, of course, is, I'm not the only one. Uh, there are so many people. If you check, uh, uh, is it possible to share a screen or something? Or you can maybe share. Uh, uh, James, can you please yep. check that uh, chapter 4, verse 30, 34? Uh, let's see. It's one uh, thing. Is or if, if you want me to share it. Yeah, I, I can definitely. Know. If you want to click screen share, the only reason I'm hesitant on my side is if I pull up too many windows, OBS starts to slow All down right. on me. I don't know how to share because you are Zoom. I don't know how to share. We we uh we we, we know we know Surah four verse thirty four pretty well. No, so I want to know. I want to know. I want to show you so many different uh, you know different uh, translation. Okay? okay. So it's not only me. Uh, there are other people who uh, believe the same. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, and the translation is there. I just would like to see if uh, uh, what is it? Um, 
if I should share it or James. Sure. That, it's a little because, easier for me because sometimes OBS otherwise will yeah, slow yeah. down on me. I'm updating yeah. my laptop soon. But if you go if to you the center. If you were on StreamYards, I would know how to share it. But because it's I know. Zoom, we're, I don't but know. don't worry, yes. Zoom's pretty easy too. The right. bottom center of your window, there's a green button with a little ah, yeah, upward. Share, share screen, yes. You bet. So shall I sh share it or? Sure, you can feel free right now. We're ready for All you. Right, okay, let me see. I will, uh, uh, here we go. In the meantime, I want to remind you folks, our guests are linked in the description. That includes if you're listening via the podcast. We put our guest links in the description there as well. And, and, and why, uh, while Muji is pulling that up, I'll, I'll just break down the, the, uh, the relevance. So Surah 4 verse 34 is the famous uh, wife-beating verse mm -hmm. of the Quran. And uh, so in, in normal translations we would use, it says that if your wife is uh, rebellious in some way, and there will be different translations of that, then there was this. Uh, these three different options for you, uh, and some would list it as, you know, going in order. And so one would be you admonish her, so you warn her about what it is that you're upset about. Uh, two, you banish her to a separate bed. And the final step would be you beat her or you scourge her. And so we look at that verse and we say, uh, wow, this is advocating wife beating. That's how it was interpreted in the Hadith where uh, husbands would, I mean, in, in Sahih al-Bukhari, there was a husband who beat his wife until her skin turned green. And so very, very horrible passage and definitely responsible for a lot of the uh, oppression and abuse of women in Muslim countries today. And I think where Muji's going with this is he's going to say that there are different translations of, the, of this, and maybe some of these translations wouldn't say that this involves beating women. So I'm guessing that's where he's okay, going. Okay, uh, because it's a little bit uh, getting time now. Uh, do you agree that there are other uh, translations? Or I, sh I shall find it for you. Let me see. Four, okay, four, I found it. Four, thirty-four. Four, thirty-four, okay. All right, now uh, I want to share. All right, I found it and I want to share it. Share screen. Yes. Do you see it now? Uh, no, you'll no, have to click on the no, window no. that you want to share. There you go. There, okay. So let me see um, this uh, guilty change of ways. Uh, okay, so Muhammad, Muhammad Assad says, then beat them. Yes, yes. And then uh, there are, uh, let me see, find, uh, there were some who say, leave, leave them. Uh, you're looking for that third one there, Safi Kaskas, yeah. never Safi heard of that Kaskas, before. Yeah. Yeah, Safi Kaskas, and there are others as well, okay? So it is not, uh, uh, how we, we can, uh, okay, uh, chapter, uh, how we can understand this uh, verse. Let me see, I'll go back to, I'll go back. Uh, I want to, I don't know how to, okay, stop sharing, okay, up there, all right. Uh, this is a little bit difficult. Yes, uh, chapter three, verse seven. Okay, mm -hmm. I will read it for you. Chapter three, verse seven says how to to read Quran. Uh, it is he who has sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book. In it are verses that are precise. They are the foundation of the book, and others unspecific. As for those whose heart is uh, corrupted, they will follow that of it which is unspecific, desiring to create confusion and uh, and their own interpretation. And no one knows its interpretation, true interpretation, except Allah and those firm in knowledge. And they say, we believe in it, all of it uh, is from our Lord, and no one will be reminded except those of understanding. So it means that uh, David Wood is definitely not among, uh, is not Allah and not among those firm in knowledge. So how those firm in knowledge, they understand the true meaning of chapter four, verse three, uh, 34, sorry, is that they put it uh, that, um, let me find it, strike. They put this uh, uh, verse, okay? First of all, you have to put it beside the, 
uh, precise verses of Quran, which Allah is the most merciful, most uh, you know forgiving, most uh, just. So these verse, if it is wife beating, is definitely goes against those foundation of Quran. And now, if uh, we put it beside other verses of Quran, okay, uh, we see that strike has been used in many different uh, verses of Quran with different meanings. In Quran verse 435, strike is ignore. In Quran verse 4101, strike is travel. 1811, strike is cover. 2077, strike is search and many other uh, different meanings. Now, the, the, the verse itself, when you put it, uh, first of all, uh, if Allah came to, uh, you know, because Allah said that when you enter, want to enter someone's house, knock on the door, get permission before you enter. If people used to do this, and Allah said that, then it would be uh, a little bit strange and people would uh, say that, Oh, uh, why Allah, Allah is crazy, we, we do that, but because people were not doing it, so Allah sent this message. So people have been beating their wives entire history. Only during lockdown in Mexico, three, four months, 1,000 women were killed in domestic problems. So this wife beating has always been going up. If Allah wanted that they beat their wives, then he wouldn't send any, uh, you know, message revelation and say beat your wife because people were doing that so what happens is as a husband i know that these three steps first one uh, you know advise them second one is to separate bed it's not five minutes or ten minutes it's definitely several nights that you have to separate bed and i know as a husband day after you come down if you're angry you come down and you forget you uh, become again you know love one another and then the, the verse, next verse, 435 says that, and in case you fear split between the two, split after he bet her or after he separated her, definitely after he separated, he left her, then sent forth a judge from his family and a judge from her family in cause, uh, sorry, in case they both are willing to act righteously, Allah will cause them to reach an agreement between them. Surely Allah is all knowing, all ever. So it is, not the, it is not only the husband who has the right, but the woman also has the right to come back to that relation or not, okay? So- I've got to, yes. just to- oh, you yeah, would I like just want, to add something, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to, to respond to some of the things uh, that you've been saying. Um, so Surah 4 verse 34 of the Quran, uh, notice there is a, progression of severity that suggests that the the third step is going to be uh, the worst so at first there's a warning then there's banishing them to separate beds and then there's something more severe and uh, most leaving. most trend well you say it's leaving um, so yeah. uh, Pickthall says uh, Pickthall says scourge them uh, Yusuf Ali says, uh, beat them, but then it adds in parentheses lightly, even though that's not in the text. Uh, Hilali Khan says, beat them, and then adds lightly also because it's copying the, uh, the Yusuf Ali there. Uh, M.H. Shakir, um, leave them alone in sleeping places and beat them. Uh, Arbery, banish them to their couches and beat them. Palmer, Remove them to bed, remove them into bed chambers and beat them. So it seems very natural for translators to translate this as beat them. Now you're arguing that uh, that well, there can be different translations, and it, this word is used in different ways. I would have to say a, a couple of things. One, you have modern Muslim apologists. I'm sure you would disagree with them, like Daniel Hakikachu, who argues that this is uh, very important in Islam, that you be able to beat your wives. You have Muhammad Hijab, who, like you, says that this could be translated in different ways. He uses that as an argument against Quran-only Muslims to say that if you don't have something else to go on, then you could basically translate this however you want. I mean, the Quran says, you know, uh, strike at their necks. Uh, when it's talking about fighting the unbelievers, strike at their necks. And so you could actually think that, you know, this third step here is is uh, is is killing your wife if that's all you have to go on and, and you're, you're, you're finally uh, done with her. So if you have if you have 
all of these different interpretations available, it seems like you need something to clarify what the meaning is. And so the natural Muslim response would be to go to the historical background or to go to the Hadith and see uh, how this, this verse was implemented. So the historical background, uh, according to Muslim sources that deal with it, explain what the what the uh, what the historical background was, is that a woman came to Muhammad to say that her husband had hit her in the face. Muhammad was about to judge in her favor and say, so there would be some retaliation against the man. And then Allah reveals Surah 4, verse 34, saying that he had the right to beat you. And Muhammad even says, uh, I wanted one thing, but Allah wanted something else. So I wanted retaliation against your husband for hitting you, but Allah wanted this. And so the, the, the verse is a defense of a man beating his wife. We also see, as I pointed out in the hadiths, that uh, men would beat their wives even until their skin turned green, and there was uh, there was no problem with that. And then, so so if you go outside the Quran to look for clarification, you it clarifies it in a way that means some some form of beating. And so that would be the deciding factor. Uh, last thing I just want to mention is you you brought up Surah three, verse seven of the Quran, uh, which was which that was brought up in response to Christians who were pointing out some theological problems with the Quran. Uh, but notice up until then, the repeated claim of Allah throughout the Quran was that the Quran is perfectly clear. So just as one quick example, uh, Surah 26, verse two of the Quran, these are the verses of a book that makes things clear. And over and over and over, Quran, over in the Quran, we hear how the Quran is clear, that its verses are explained in detail. Then some Christians start attacking the Quran theologically, and then the claims comes down in Surah 3, verse 7, that, well, there are unclear parts as well. And people are going to use the unclear parts, uh, you know, to, to attack Islam with their misunderstandings. And so how do... How do we reconcile the Quran's repeated claims to be clear with the claim that some of it is unclear? Well, Muslim scholars have dealt with that, and the general consensus is that the clear parts are the commands. They're the commands that are telling you what to do. The unclear parts are theological things that may be difficult to understand. So notice the reason Allah would have to be clear in his commands. If you're correct, and Surah 4, verse 34 is just this unclear thing. Well, this is telling you how to treat your wife if you if you fear that she's rebelling against you in some in some way. The Quran is telling you this is what you need to do in this situation. If that's not clear, then Muhammad Hijab is right. You don't know what that verse is saying, and you can insert your own meaning into it. You can say, oh, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to uh, attack my wife with extreme physical violence because uh, it can mean that, or you, you could do what you're doing and say, no, I'm going to, I'm just going to leave her. Um, so if, if you're telling me that Allah is, is that unclear in his commands, then the Quran cannot be the solution to problems. The Quran cannot be a solution to the problem of the abuse of women, because according to you, it's not clear and you can insert whatever meaning you want into the text. Okay, now uh, I respond to that. It is clear for those fearing knowledge, okay? Not for everyone, it's not clear. And I told you that how to understand that uh, the, the meaning, you have to put it beside other verses of Quran. Uh, for example, in chapter 65, verse six, let the women who are undergoing a waiting period live in the same manner as you live yourself. This is talking about a woman that I have divorced and I don't want to live with her. Maybe I hate even her, but Allah command me that uh, that uh, live in the same manner as you uh, live yourself in accordance with your means and do not harass them with the view of making their lives a misery. And if they happen to be uh, with child, spend freely uh, on them. This is about ch uh, children, but anyway, it uh, teaching people to treat them well. Quran 4, 19, O believers, it is not pr uh, permissible for you to inherit women against their will or mistreat them to make them return some of uh, the uh, dowry as a, a ransom for divorce, unless they are found uh, guilty of uh, adultery. Treat them fairly. If you happen to dislike them, you may hate something which Allah turns into the, to a great blessing. Quran 30, 21. Allah uh, talks about uh, 
love between wife and husband. And it is among his signs that he has created for you wives from among yourself so that you may find uh, tranquility in them. And he has created love and kindness between you. Surely in, his, in this, there are signs for a people who reflect. So suddenly Allah who wants love between husband and wife, there he every a child understand that with beating wife you cannot solve any problem now uh, about the muhammad hijab and uh, you know uh, daniel Hagirachu, i told you that i'm fighting myself i'm blocked by them because they cannot answer my question now to, uh, another example for you to to prove you that they have zero knowledge of islam themselves uh, read for me chapter 5 verse 38 please david sir 5 verse 38 Yes, yes, please. Uh, any particular translation? Uh, no, just uh, I think all of them are the same. All right, so uh, M.H. Shakir, and as for the man who steals and the woman who steals, cut off their hands as a punishment for what they have earned and exemplary punishment from Allah, and Allah is mighty and wise. Can you read others? It's the same all, I think. I think yeah, I could go. So, Pickthal, uh, as for the thief, both male and female, cut off their hands. Are, are you talking about the hand-cutting part? Yes, I can just read that I, part. I, okay. I, yes, uh, Yusuf Ali, as to the thief, male or female, cut off his or her hands. Hilali Khan, cut off the wrist joint, uh, from the wrist joint, the right hand of the thief, male or female, as a recompense for that which they committed. Shakir, and as for the man who steals and the woman who steals, cut off their hands as a punishment okay, for what they've earned. Okay. I think it's enough, yeah? So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you know the uh, uh, in Arabic, uh, which word is uh, has been used for cut and hand, or chop and hand? No, go ahead so, and enlighten yeah, it's, us. It's, yes, it is cut and yad. Cut means uh, has many thirty two times has been used in Quran with many different meanings. Yad, which is hand, has been also used hundred twenty times in Quran with many different meanings. Now. Read for me chapter 12, verse 30, 31, please. 1231? Yes, yes. 1231. So when she heard of their sly talk, she sent for them and prepared for them a repast and gave each of them a knife and said to Yusuf, come forth to them. So when they saw him, they deemed him great and cut their hands in amazement and said, Remote is Allah from imperfection. So are you talking about the cutting the hands part? Yeah, yeah. Can you continue? Um, continue to read that. The, the okay. Verse. They deemed him great and cut their hands in amazement and said, Remote is Allah from imperfection. This is not a mortal. This is but a noble angel. Okay. So this is exactly the same words that has been used in chapter 5, verse 38. There in 538, it is chopping hands. Here they use cut hands because it doesn't make sense that when they were, uh, you know, cutting uh, or peeling uh, a fruit, yeah, they chop their own hands. It doesn't make sense. In reality, it doesn't even make sense that they cut their hands and women didn't scream. They became, uh, you know, romantic and so passion and they were talking, no scream, no blood, nothing Quran is talking. So that's why it doesn't mean uh, uh, what is it? Chopping hands that that words, which they all uh, you know uh, translated. It is interpretation. Allah says in Quran, uh, you know uh, that. Uh, let me see. Uh, Allah, uh, Quran, chapter five, verse sixty-four. Those uh, Jews said, Allah's hands are tied. It is the they whose hands are tied. They are cursed by Allah for what they have said. God's both hands are open wide. So Allah, according to these uh, backward uh, you know, scholars, Allah has hands. Despite it is uh, clear that Allah, nothing is compared to Allah. And here Allah the, use the hand as you know, power. So, and you cannot tie powers. You can stop power. So that tie also becomes stop. So they try to stop Allah's power, not Allah's hands. And then Allah says that, don't put yourself in hellfire with your own hands. You cannot put yourself in fire, hellfire with your own hands. That's your deeds. Hand is here, deeds. So chapter 538 says that uh, stop their action, action of stealing. And next verse, next verse 539 says that, and if they 
repent, Allah will forgive them. I ask this Farid, okay? How can Allah forgive someone that you have already chopped his hands, okay? He said, you know, because it is like that you pass the red light and then the officer capture you, stop you, and then take your driving license, give you a thousand dollars ticket and tells you that, uh, uh, and then you say, I repent, please forgive me. And then the officer says that, okay, I forgive you, but I don't give you a driving license I and you have to pay your thousand uh, dollar ticket. It doesn't make sense, it's crazy. You have to give me back my t uh, driving license and I don't have to pay the ticket. If I'm, you know, I have to do all those, then I'm not forgiven. So the, the verse uh, uh, says that, you know, that uh, stop them and if they, uh, you know, repent, Allah will forgive them, okay? So uh, these people, they, they, they translate Quran. As we read in chapter three, verse seven, and these, are, they, these need to be interpreted, okay? You mm -hmm. cannot, and then um, there is another. Uh, I can, uh, uh, let me go. Let me go and respond yes, to some yes, of the please. stuff you brought up, and then we could go on to your next point. Um, so back on the on the issue of uh, beating women into submission, uh, you you brought up some other verse uh, some other verses like you know don't make women return their dowry and so on. Um, and love, none of the, uh, love, none of, love the, yes, yeah, love between men and husband. Yeah. So verse. Uh, Surah 4 verse 34 uh, specifically is about wives from whom you fear rebellion and it gives you this uh, gives you this this three step process i just want to say if that's not about beating then the quran is hopelessly unclear and the historical background and the way it was interpreted by muhammad and his followers uh, they they misinterpreted it. So they all got it wrong. And it's not until we get down to to you when we actually finally understand what Allah means. You quoted Surah uh, 65 verse 6, which, as you pointed out, is about divorce. Uh, but, but this is another perfect example of this problem of the Quran being horribly unclear. Just two verses before that, you have Surah 65 verse 4, which, according to... Uh, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Abbas, the two Jalals, Maududi, even Muhammad Hijab is talking about divorcing girls that have not reached puberty after you've had sex with them. So that's another perfect example. You know, I mean, you can you can talk about that or, or not talk about it. I know we, as you pointed out, we don't have time to to get to everything, but it's another example of Muslims for 14 centuries interpreting a verse in a certain way. And if it means something else, then it sounds like the text is the problem. And this brings us up to the cutting off of hands. For 14 centuries, for 14 centuries, Muslims have interpreted this as chopping off hands. And there are places where they actually carry out that punishment still. For thieves, you can see horrible videos online where they're actually amputating uh, people's hands and so on for stealing. But for 14 centuries, that's been interpreted to mean you cut off hands. You can just go down the line of every mainstream translation. It's chopping off hands. So here's my point. In all of these verses, there are two possibilities. Either it means what it sounds like it means, what, it's, what it has sounded like it means for 14 centuries, what Muslims have interpreted it to mean for 14 centuries, or it means something different. Uh, so those are the two, it means something different, and, and you're right about the interpretation, and you're going to other verses and interpreting the meaning. So those are the two, those are the two possibilities. And I'm saying one is not significantly better than the other. So... In other words, if if you take a verse of the Quran that says, if you fear rebellion from your wives, then beat them, and it actually means beat them, or sir, nine it's verse not rebellion. twenty. It's not yeah. rebellion. It's yeah, that. What, 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 whatever the, the the point is, the point is whatever that means, whatever that means. Um, or Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who do not believe in Allah, or okay. chopping or yeah. chopping off hands. No, no, I, I just want to say what the two yes, possibilities yes. are. Yes. The two possibilities are, it means what it has seemed like it means to Muslims for a long time. And it, it means what it, it seems like it means to translators who are translating it as, uh, you know, divorcing prepubescent girls or as uh, beating women or as to chopping off hands or as to fighting people who don't believe in Allah. It either means that or... It sounds like it means that to the vast majority of people who've ever interpreted it, even though it doesn't mean that. 
And I'm saying the, one of those is not is not tremendously better than the other. What's practically speaking, as far as because you're, it sounds like you're arguing that that Muhammad was sent to solve these practical situations in the world. Practically speaking, as far as you know how it would impact us in the world, what's the difference between a book that actually calls for chopping off hands and um, having sex with prepubescent girls and fighting unbelievers and beating women into submission. What's the difference between a book that actually calls for those things and a book that just sounds like it's calling for those things to the vast majority of, of interpreters down through history, but it actually means something different. Either way, either way, you get abuse of women, you get uh, violence against unbelievers. Either way, you get all these problems that Islam is causing in the world. And so once again, if Muhammad was sent to solve the problems, horrible job. All right. Um, uh, that's uh, if, uh, because God has given its command and um, it is up to people to understand it and uh, why he didn't send, uh, for example, uh, there are atheists who say that, uh, like, I don't know, for sure, you know, one of them who says that if God uh, right now light up my uh, wet napkin, I, uh, you know, believe in God. Who said uh, that? A, uh, it's a YouTuber. <laughs> His okay. name is uh, Pankrick. <laughs> he always uh, say that. But uh, God could, of course, uh, create us perfect. He could create us. Uh, there was an atheist also who was asking why he, God didn't create us perfect. Yeah, he could create us perfect and uh, so on. There are so many uh, questions like this, but um, for those who, uh, you know, understand and read Quran and why they didn't, you know, interpret it in the correct way, I can play for you a, a, a video from Sajid, you know, Sajid for sure you have heard about him. He's a YouTuber. I know and Sajid. He, yeah, yeah. And he got problem with uh, Ali Dawa and, uh, you know, Muhammad Hijab. And he was explaining, I have uh, the clip. He was explaining that when he was in Medina, there were those who, if you disagree with them, there was a kind of a mafia, yeah? If you dis disagree with them, they would, you know, boycott you, boycott you if you didn't go with their interpretation. So unfortunately, well, uh, as I uh, read in the beginning, many people uh, who go and become uh, mullahs or priests or so on, they go for, it is their job, they want to, uh, you know, make a living from that, uh, that job. And later, they don't want to lose their job by going against the mainstream, okay? And they follow the mainstream and they don't want troubles. That's, that's the problem. And uh, uh, yeah, let, let me just, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm going to state where I, where I agree with you. Yes. And then, and then you can continue. Um, historically, uh, any group that gets in power wants to maintain their control. They want to main. They want to maintain control. So this would be. Uh, I think you're referring to. I think I saw it. I've only seen a couple of uh, Sajid videos, but uh, I think I saw that one where he's saying that it was. Uh, I think it was the the, the Salafi group that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah, they basically they basically start asking you questions as soon as you got there and you were in trouble if uh, yeah, if yeah, you exactly. if you weren't on the same page of them. Yeah. So uh, yeah, a, a, any group that gets in power uh, and. Christians are guilty of this. Atheists are guilty of this. Muslims are guilty of this. Every, everyone can do this. Uh, once you get on, once you're once you're at the top, uh, you try to you try to maintain um, that position. But when when we're so here's where I would disagree. When when we're talking about Islam, we're not talking about this group that that came to power. That group that came to power. We're talking about people who just study the the, the Muslim sources yeah. right now. They generally yeah. tend to to disagree with your interpretation. And they, they they tend to to agree with with the mainstream interpretations. But but go ahead. I know. I know. I, I just uh, want to say that uh, I uh, follow an organization, a Muslim organization, that they also have the same interpretation and a beautiful interpretation of uh, Islam. So anyway, uh, and then uh, after right after this, uh, um, you know. Uh, stream. I, I will go live on my channel. Those who would like to ask me a question, uh, they are welcome. And usually I have my live stream. Uh, those who watch it later, they, they are welcome so that we go deeper because I, I'm sure that we don't have time for all this. And then uh, about the, the, you know, that uh, uh, verb you said, it is Nashu's uh, rebellion, you, you said in chapter four verse. Uh, 34, okay? Chapter 4, verse 128, use the same verb, nashuz. If a woman fear indifference or neglect from her husband, here they translate it as neglect or difference, okay? They don't, uh, uh, you know, they don't translate it as uh, 
uh, rebellion. It's, but this is the same verb. There is. Yeah, no I'm, I'm looking. Uh, yeah, I just want to. Uh, I just want to point out that that uh, even even in the translations I'm looking at, they give a lot of different uh, translations. Exactly. So the, the the one I was talking about was Pickthall. Uh, he says, "For those from whom you fear rebellion," and mm -hmm. then Yusuf Ali. Yusuf Ali says, "As to those women on whose part you fear disloyalty and ill conduct." Uh, Haleli Khan says, as to those women on whose part you see ill conduct, um, Shakir says, as to those on whose part you fear desertion. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of yeah. different, uh, uh, you know, uh, translation or interpretation. Now, about Kufri, you said that uh, uh, disbelievers, you know, mm -hmm. they have always been, uh, you know, abusing this, uh, uh, the war, uh, Kufr. Uh, as disbelievers, okay. Now uh, I would uh, like to uh, I would like you to uh, to read this uh, chapter sixteen, verse eighty three. If you 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 don't mind. Do you say sixteen or sixty? Sixteen. Okay. Sixteen eighty three. Okay. They recognize the favor of Allah, yet they deny it, and most of them are ungrateful. Okay, and then uh, uh, who are they? They, they are, they uh, recognize the favor Kafirs. of Allah, mm -hmm. the, the disbelievers, yeah? Kafirs. They don't believe, yes. The, can you read more, please? Uh, do you have the, more translations? Uh, yeah, so 16 verse 83, uh, Pictal, they know the favor of Allah and then deny it. Most of them are ingrates. Yusuf Ali, they recognize the favor of favors of Allah, then they deny them, and most of them are ungrateful creatures. Hilali Khan, they recognize the grace of Allah, yet they deny it by worshiping others besides Allah, and most of them are disbelievers, so they, they give the disbelievers. Uh, and then Shakir uh, says ungrateful, Sher Ali says disbelievers. Right, okay. Khan. Enough, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, but this is kafir. Most of them are kafir. So how come here they translate it as other things than disbelievers? So kufr in Islam, in Quran, is not disbeliever, it is a bad deeds, those who oppress, those who do bad deeds, that's that's the kuf. That's why here Allah says most of disbelievers are kafir. Not all of them are kafir, okay? And chapter uh, 98, verse 1, those who commit kufr among the people of the scripture and the uh, polyestes did not give up kufr until there came to them clear evidence. So it is not about all people of this uh, scripture and not all uh, polyesthetists. It's, it it's, 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 it's those who reject the those, Quran. No, no, no. It's those who commit kof, okay? Those who commit kof among the people. So they all of them rejected Prophet Muhammad. Otherwise, they would be Muslim. They wouldn't be Christian or, or, or Jews or uh, polyesthetists. Quran 98 verse 6. Indeed, they who committed kufr among the people of the scripture and the polistis will be in the uh, fire of hell, abiding entirely daring. Those are the words of creation. So it's talking about those among, not all of them, not 100%. Now about uh, you, uh, you were saying, um, uh, you, you know, this uh, Christian, I think uh, you, you have uh, people bring up uh, a lot that... Uh, uh, because Allah says in chapter 60, verse 8, Allah does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of religion and do not expel you from your homes, from being righteous towards them and acting justly towards them. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. Chapter 29, verse 46, and do not argue with the people of the book, uh, the scripture, except in the way that is best, except for those who commit injustice among them and say, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you, and our God and your God is one, and we are Muslims submitted to him. So there are many other uh, uh, verses as well, uh, talking good about Christian and Jews. Uh, and uh, anyway, so- uh, I, I, just I just have a, a quick question based on, um, well, I, I'm, I'm wondering how you would interpret uh, certain verses in the light of what you're saying. So I just wanted to ask you about two verses. One, in, in chapter 60, uh, you mentioned chapter 60, verse 8. So just wondering if you'd agree with the translation just a few verses earlier, Surah 60, verse 4. Mm -hmm. Surah 60, verse 4, which gives Abraham as an example. Um, 
but it, the, uh, the let me read the the Shakir here. Uh, M. H. Shakir translates this as indeed there is for you a good example in Ibrahim, Abraham, and those with him when they said to their people, "Surely we are clear of you and of what you serve besides Allah." We declare ourselves to be clear of you, and enmity and hatred have appeared between us and you forever until you believe in Allah alone. So he says, between our two groups, there is enmity and hatred between them forever until they believe in Allah alone. So how would you interpret that in light of your the way you interpreted Surah 60 verse 8? All right, as I said in chapter 3, verse 7, you have to put such a verses beside other verses of Quran where Quran talks uh, about, you know, here as well, uh, said most of them, uh, most disbelievers are, are, you know, kofar, not all of them. So as, uh, as long as you, Allah says also, as long as if you avoid major uh, sins as well, I forgive your minor sins. So those people, uh, God wanted that they give up their kuf, which was, uh, you know, killing each other. Uh, there are so many uh, verses that uh, I have to bring up. Uh, but but it uh, says, until you believe in Allah alone. Yeah, but I, I say that you have to... Enmity and yeah, hatred yeah, until you I believe said, in Allah alone. Yes, yes. I said that you have to put it beside other verses to understand the pure, uh, you know, interpretation of it. It doesn't mean that if you don't believe, okay, and you don't do bad deeds, then there is uh, this hatred between us. Chapter 60, verse 8 said to you that if they don't fight you, if they don't attack you, Allah doesn't forbid you from being righteous. So you have to put that one beside these type of verses. See that only if they attack you, only if they kill you, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, let me uh, read it again for you. Uh, Next verse of chapter 8, uh, 60, verse 8, which I read for you, next one is 9. Allah only forbids you from those who fight you because of religion and expel you from your home and aid in your expulsion that you make allies of them. So Allah forbids us from, you know, it is not only about, you know, disbelievers. It's about, uh, uh, sorry, ISIS, Taliban, okay? Ayatollah Khomeini, this fascist, uh, you know, guy and his regime. So I am I'm their, their enemy, I'm fighting them, and I will never make, uh, you know, because they expel us from our, our home. I'm living now in Sweden many years. I cannot go back to my country. So they expel me from my home. They killed my brother. They killed so many other people, despite they call themselves Muslim. So Allah forbid us from all these oppressors. Doesn't matter what you believe in. So in the Islam that I understand, the Quran that I understand, you are my brother, but please, next time you do any sh show, put me bes not beside, you know, ISIS and Taliban. Separate us from each other because we, uh, as a Muslim, I love, uh, you know, everybody, those who, uh, you know, don't oppress other people, those who don't kill others. I, uh, I have a, a Christian brother from South Africa. He's watching now, Martin, and uh, he had very prejudice before he come to my show. Now he's, uh, uh, what is it? Um, he's always in my show. We love each other, we, each other. We are like brothers. So I want peace. I want to make peace between people. And uh, the, unfortunately, these extremists like ISIS and Taliban and all of them, they have just created a lot of problems. And uh, the, uh, now I would like to talk about the solution to our problems because. Oh, said, uh, uh, let, let, let me let me just uh, quickly address what you just said because uh, uh, I'm going I'm going to agree with you that uh, definitely 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 uh, all sorts of Muslims in the world and uh, just to be clear I definitely would not put you in the same category with uh, with mm -hmm. ISIS or the mullahs or uh, anything like that uh, but there is this ongoing issue of these different ways of. Uh, understanding the Quran. So uh, I just wanted to yes, say, yes. just as an example of the difference in perspective, so you're quoting Surah 60, verse 8, and using that to interpret uh, Surah, uh, Surah 60, verse 4, and so on. But if you look at a commentary, uh, you can look at uh, Tafsir Jalalain, so the two Jalals, if you read Surah 60, verse 8, in a translation like, I mean, in, in a commentary like that, it will just say this verse was abrogated by the command to fight them. 
So it's this ongoing issue of if you take a verse that you would quote to show that uh, Islam is not calling for violence against uh, unbelievers just for being unbelievers or something like that, you would have uh, a lot of voices in mainstream Islamic scholarship would, would simply say, well, that verse has been abrogated. And it's because the Quran in Surah 2 verse 106, for instance, refers to the doctrine of abrogation. So I think we're back to this issue of if the Quran is supposed to be solving these problems, it's really, really uh, unclear. Now, with that said, go yeah. ahead and go yeah, ahead, so, whatever, so, so, whatever you're going to say. Yeah. Which verse they said that it was abrogated? Can you tell me, please? Yeah, Surah 60, verse 8. I can pull up Jalalain if you if you want, but uh, Tafsir uh, Jalalain says Surah 60, yeah, no, verse no, no. 8 was abrogated okay. by commands yes. to fight. All right, okay. So uh, uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 7 said that those whose heart is corrupted, they seek an interpretation suitable for their, you know, their agenda, okay? Uh, so my, uh, you know, uh, interpretation is for good of peace, which is uh, Islam stand uh, on on it. OK, and uh, if it was abrogated here is clear. Chapter 60, verse nine says that Allah only uh, forbid you from those who fight you. <clears throat> so there was a fight going on. OK, those who fight you and expel you from your uh, your home because of your religion. So this is uh, this is clear and many other, uh, you know, uh, uh, chapter uh, verses of Quran. So let me. Uh, yeah. So so the, the, just like the, the the claim is that at the time that was revealed, yes, that's what it meant. But later you have uh, uh, Surah nine verse twenty nine, Surah nine verse one twenty three, Surah nine verse seventy three, and so on, which are calls to fight unbelievers. So even if even if you think they're wrong, I just want people to understand, yeah, understand their yeah. perspective their perspective versus your perspective. Okay. I just wanted one more verse. I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna respond. I just want to know how what what you okay. think this verse uh, means. So Surah nine verse verse 111 uh, in I'll read MH Shakir says surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this that they shall have the garden they fight in Allah's way so they slay and are slain so this is the this is the context of a lot of verses in Surah 9 which talk about uh, fighting the unbelievers, fight those uh, of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hard, hardness, fight those who do not believe in Allah until they pay the jizya and so on. And here that the, looks like the, the, the context, and this verse actually explains what it means to be fighting people. So surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. So it sounds like what Allah means by fighting unbelievers in these verses involves slaying and getting slain, killing until you get killed. Again, I, I, uh, I don't want to get into an argument. Like I, I'm actually, I just, All right, okay. I, 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 let me put, these are verses that I bring up a lot. And so if there is an alternative interpretation, uh, I'd just be yes, happy yes, for you to go and share. Yeah, yeah just, uh, I, I would love to. Uh, chapter four, verse 89, they wish that you uh, should be a kafir just uh, as they are. Kafirs, so that uh, you may all be uh, alike. Do not, uh, therefore, take them uh, from them allies until they immigrate in the way of Allah. But if they turn their backs, seize them and slay them wherever you come upon them. Take none of them for your ally or uh, helper. Chapter next chapter. Next, sorry, next verse. Unless it be such of them who seek refuge with the pe with uh, people who are joined with you by uh, uh, covenant, or those who come to you because their their hearts uh, shrink from fighting either against you or against their own people, had Allah so willed, He would certainly have given them power over you. So anyway, uh, 91 also, you will find others uh, who wish to obtain uh, security from you and obtain security from their people every time uh, they are uh, returned to state of oppression, they fall back into it. So if they do not withdraw from you or offer you peace, or restrain their hands, then seize them and kill them wherever you overtake them. And those we have made for them uh, against, uh, yes, okay. So it is always as long as they fight. 
And if the uh, chapter eight, verse 61, and if they incline to peace, then incline to it also and rely upon Allah. Indeed, it is he who is uh, the hearing, the, the known. There are so many other verses that is as long as they, they fight, okay? And then we know that there was a 10 year, uh, you know, ceasefire between, uh, um, uh, you know, Muslim and the pagans, okay? Uh, and the moment, the moment Prophet Muhammad signed that, that treaty and all scholars agree that they also these uh, pagans, they tried to uh, provoke Muslims to fight, but Prophet Muhammad gave them direct order that you do not, uh, do not fight, okay? So uh, in that also treaty, the moment that he signed the, the, the agreement, those verses that say go and kill them, fight them, are abrogated definitely because Prophet Muhammad said stop fighting now, okay? So they start to bring them to Islam by, by words, okay? Not by sword, okay? So, and uh, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, share something fast here, very fast, uh, please. I want to share this. Uh, uh, I don't know, you see it? Shh. Yeah, we got a picture. Yeah, we got a picture. This is the organization that um, I'm following, okay? And these women are head of that organization. They are Muslim women, okay? And they, they are leading uh, a fight against the fascist regime of Iran, okay? So they interpret Islam totally different to those backward extremist uh, Muslims who say that women uh, ha have to be sit home, do nothing. They, and then you were reading uh, something, uh, you know, a, a fabricated hadith about Prophet Muhammad said that, uh, you know, if um, a nation take uh, women as their leaders uh, are failure and so on. These so, are but just women. to be clear, you, you believe that you believe that Bukhari is, is fabricated? A lot of his, uh, uh, you know, I don't say all of them, but a lot of his uh, hadiths are fabricated. For example, that, uh, uh, let me stop. Did you stop it? Okay, okay very mm -hmm. good. A lot of his uh, hadiths, like, you know, that moon splitting, okay, uh, that you mention it a lot of times. It's a fabricated hadith because Quran says like this. Uh, uh, let me, uh, miracle, miracle. Uh, Quran says absolutely against it. It says that in chapter 29, verse 50, 50, and 51, but they say, why are not signs sent down to him from his Lord? They are talking about Prophet Muhammad. Say, the signs are only with Allah, and I am only a clear warner. And it is, is it not sufficient for them what we reveal to you, the book, which is Quran, which is recited to them, Indeed, in that is a mercy and reminder for the people who believe. Chapter 6, verse 31, uh, 35. If their aversion is too hard on you, O Muhammad, <clears throat> then seek, if you can, a tunnel into the, uh, to the earth or a ladder into the sky in order to bring them a sign. Had Allah so willed, he would have brought all of them to, to the right path. So never be one of the ignore it. Chapter 6, verse 37. And they say, why has a sign not been sent down to him he, uh, from his Lord? Say, indeed, Allah is able to send down a sign, but most of them do not know. Chapter 6, verse 109. And they swear by all their strongest oath that if a sign came down, uh, came to them, they would surely believe in it say the signs are only with Allah and what will make you precise, uh, perceive that even if a sign came, they, they would not believe. There are many other verses. So how come Allah says here that, no, you don't need the si a sign. The sign is Quran. But later he, he split the moon and nowhere talk about it in Quran, despite he's talking about, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Moses, uh, uh, what is that? Just to keep Steve the conversation become, moving, I've got... Talk, uh, Allah talk about it very, you know, exaggerating. Just to keep the conversation well. going, I've got to ask if we might transition back over to David soon, too. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I just, I'm actually, we're actually on the same page. So there's been a few things where we're totally on the same page. So we, yes, we both don't good. like the, uh, the mullahs in Iran. We both agree that there are very different kinds of Muslims in the world, and, and we shouldn't uh, lump them all together. 
Thank you, my uh, brother. We, we, yeah, as long we, as you do that, you are my yeah, brother. Yeah. Okay. We agree. We agree. We agree that uh, that there are unclear parts of the Quran and that interpretation is required. We agree on that, and we agree here uh, that. In case anyone didn't didn't understand the, the very important point being made, that was a criticism of Bukhari, and he and I would agree that that looks like that was a, these were later stories that people made up. So you have in later Muslim sources the claim that Muhammad is performing miracles like splitting the moon when according to the Quran, and I assume this is what you, the, 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 as you read, the Quran is Muhammad's miracle. He's not performing these various kinds of miracles. Um, so the Quran is denying that Muhammad performed miracles apart from delivering the Quran itself, and therefore later stories, like we find in Sahih al-Bukhari, which talk about Muhammad uh, performing these miracles, those had to be made up because they're actually contradicting the Quran. So we're totally on the same, totally on the same page there, James. Yes, very good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, about <laughs> maybe uh, we can talk more about the solution you were asking. Oh, as yeah, I yeah. Said, I think you were going to go into that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, as I said, that the rules of the jungle uh, by, you know, um, Islam is not the final message of God or Prophet Muhammad is not the, the final message of God because it has more praying, more fasting, more rules, you know, don't do this, don't do that. By saying these things, nothing will change. It helped, okay? As you said yourself, they were burying their daughters alive. By the way, those who don't know, those who deny it, uh, that they were burying their daughters alive, even today in India, they bury their daughters alive. I have on my channel the video that they, they are doing it. At. Uh, yeah, but by the way, just, 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 let, yeah. just let me agree with you on that because, because it's so, so unfamiliar, to people yeah. today, they don't realize, and I don't know how prevalent it was uh, in Arabia during the time of Muhammad, but I agree. There are people who will say it was never it was never an issue in Arabia. Um, the fact that the the fact that the Quran is responding to it and that people would have understood what 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 the what the Muslim sources are addressing makes it sound like it it certainly was an issue. Uh, but it was it was actually very common uh, in the Roman Empire, and so people think that this wasn't a serious issue. But it was an extremely serious issue in the ancient world, and it's because people stopped the practice that we're no longer we're no longer familiar with it. So yeah, yeah but, and for those who don't know, as I said, you can just Google. In the past twenty years in India, more than ten million girls have been killed before or after birth. I have videos. Two men, they are trying to bury a, a newborn girl and they get caught, police catch them and they, you know, so there, there are uh, such a things you can just Google it. So anyway, so by just saying that this is forbidden, that's haram, that's so on, it doesn't, uh, you know, solve problems. Uh, and as we see that there are so many problems. So what I'm saying is that Islam came to get rid of the source, which is we say it in Abrahamic religion is the Satan, okay? Satan is the one who fool everyone. The sources, uh, by the way, I was banned by um, EF Dawa um, just because I wanted to pick up this, um, you know, issue about Satan that uh, because in Quran says that uh, clearly that one day Satan will disappear and uh, one day uh, we will live in a uh, people become righteous and they take over the, the planet, okay? And uh, everything uh, that Ethiopia was talking is promised by God that one day will happen. And it's not by force, it's by getting rid of the, the, the opportunity that, you know, the opportunity that give, allows you by killing millions of people become billionaires. Now, uh, people call me communist, but it is not communism, it is Islam. Islam believe in equality, that we share everything with each other, we love one another, that Mecca that we were talking, you are talking many times about, is that uh, the symbol of equality where we go, when we go there, once a lifetime we have to go there, and we're equal, about a no poor. minute or two before we wrap up, or go into the uh, Q&A. All right, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, um, I was uh, explaining, but as, as I said, uh, it is very deep uh, discussion. So uh, I am sure that um, we need more, uh, more, uh, you know, time to talk about that. So I will continue, as I said, at the end of this uh, stream on my, my channel. This, the, the link is on the description. Correcting. Okay, the perfect dawa. Correcting myself. We actually do have the four minute conclusion. So with the conclusion, since we had started with you, Muji, we'll kick it over to you, assuming we were alternating this whole time. And then we'll kick it over to David before we go into the Q&A. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the conclusion is that um, uh, for me is that um, uh, we all have to uh, help each other uh, to in order to uh, live in a uh, peaceful uh, world. And um, uh, people like me, uh, if really they would, uh, David would like to, you know, get rid of these evil uh, acts uh, that happens under the name of Islam. Of course, there are. It happens under the name of other religions as well. But uh, we talk about Islam right now. So uh, you should help me and um, uh, give me voice. So uh, I would love to, uh, you know, meet that. Um, I call him ISIS guy, Daniel Hagiyaju, and talk to him and uh, you know show uh, everyone that uh, how they misinterpret uh, Quran and which I gave some uh, clear example uh, like the chapter 5 verse 38 chopping of hands and how they you know they translate it differently in different verses of Quran so and um, yeah uh, those who have more questions uh, uh, please uh, join me after this uh, show on my channel I will answer your questions you got it. We'll kick it over to David for four minutes. The floor is all yours. All right. Uh, well, in my opening statement, I pointed out that if we're uh, assessing the question, who was Muhammad? And the claim is that he was a prophet. Well, there are three considerations we'd uh, have to examine. Um, was he getting revelations from his own mind, um, intentionally or unintentionally? Was he getting revelations from a demonic source and was he getting revelations from God? Uh, as far as the arguments I laid out that Muhammad uh, really looks like some of his, uh, his revelations were coming from his own mind, simply influenced by his culture or uh, self-serving purpose. Again, you, you don't have to think that he was deliberately doing this. Uh, you can just believe that his revelations were influenced by his desires and by his surroundings. Uh, I think we have very good reasons to think that Muhammad's revelations were coming from his own mind. And I didn't see any, I didn't see any anything that would make us doubt that. Uh, second, uh, I pointed out that we have good reasons to think that uh, some of Muhammad's revelations had a demonic origin. We have, I mean, that was Muhammad's first impression of his revelations. He believed that he was demon-possessed. He became suicidal. He tried repeatedly to hurl himself off a cliff. We have, uh, in the Muslim sources, the incident of the Satanic Verses, where Muhammad received a revelation and delivered a revelation, promoting polytheism. Later, he came back and said the devil made him do it. And Muhammad uh, was a victim of black magic, a magic spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. Uh, not to mention, on top of all of that, Muhammad receiving revelations according to the sources, and, and maybe Muji re rejects these sources, at least according to the sources that most Muslims believe in, uh, sounds like something out of an exorcist film when he's receiving his revelations. And I didn't see anything that would uh, cause us to doubt uh, any of that. And so the only question is, is there any evidence that Muhammad's a prophet that would, uh, that would counterbalance that and make us think that Muhammad was a prophet? Um, what evidence have we seen that Muhammad is a true prophet? All we've seen is that, uh, that Muji thinks that he's a prophet who's sent to solve the problems of mankind. Uh, as I pointed out, I think that Muhammad did it. If that was his purpose, then he's done a terrible job because wherever we see uh, Islam go, we see lots of problems. And the people like Muji who are interpreting the Quran in a, in a different light, uh, their voices are usually drowned out by more more popular um, Muslim speakers. And so what, what's the evidence for Muhammad? Uh, Muji admitted that Muhammad didn't perform miracles, and so the Quran is his miracle. But if Muji's correct, then Muhammad's miracle and the evidence for Muhammad is the single most misunderstood book in history, right? It is the single most misunderstood book in history, a book that claims to be clear and claims to be unclear, uh, a book that the vast majority of scholars who've ever lived have completely misunderstood, a book that uh, the top translators in the world have all misunderstood. And so if, uh, if this is what we have, then we have this situation where my goodness, it seems like 99.9 .9 something percent of Muslims do not understand their book and do not understand their religion. And there are just a small handful who actually do. And so uh, 
I'll, I'll agree with Muji that there are things that we can agree on and that we would share common goals and that none of us like ISIS and none of us like uh, the mullahs who are oppressing people. So we can all be on the same page there. Uh, but I'll say for those of you Muslims out there who agree with Muji's interpretations and don't believe in groups that violently oppress, uh, your target in your dawah should primarily be should primarily be the Muslims who are influencing uh, the radical, um, the radical violent groups. So uh, direct your dawah towards them.